They are putting the interest of extreme climate ideologues over that of ordinary workers. Pretending that new licences will somehow guarantee the jobs for North Sea workers is a total illusion. Away from the noise of Westminster, oil and gas jobs are already disappearing. Will there be good low carbon jobs to replace them? Hello and welcome to The Climate Show. This week we are in Scotland, one of Europe's largest oil and gas producers. Yet its last remaining oil refinery here in Grangemouth is threatened with closure, putting hundreds of jobs at risk. While in Westminster, politicians are arguing over what to do with Scotland's remaining fossil fuel reserves, the direction of travel is clear. So how do we ensure that the workers and the communities reliant on this industry survive and that the green jobs of the future are there to replace the ones that are lost? Also on the show, no, as the government's right new oil and gas bill passes its first major Isn't hurdle in Parliament, we we'll look at the gas. numbers and hear from one Conservative who resigned over the issue. And it came a point where I could no longer condone what my government you know, was doing. And to get grass fed, would you eat fly fed? We visit one company which is banking on insects to reduce the impact of rearing meat. But first, with 500 jobs on the line at this place, what is the future for the industry's workers? Pretending that new licences will somehow guarantee the jobs for North Sea workers is a total illusion. There are 200,000 people supported by the sector. As politicians in Westminster argue over the future of oil and gas in the North Sea, workers in Scotland are worried about their jobs today. This is Grangemouth, Scotland's only oil refinery. We've got the power plant here, and we start to move around, we've got the hydrocarker. It's due to close next year with hundreds of jobs on the line, including TAMS. If that did happen, what's the impacts on you and your family, but also the community? That depends on this. I'm concerned for my future. I don't know exactly what it's, it's going to be. And my biggest concern really is for my family. What that will mean? Will it mean do I need to work away from home? Do we need to uproot our families and relocate? Or do we move away from oil and gas altogether? The site's owner, Petro Ineos, wants to convert it into an import terminal, meaning Scotland's fuels will soon have to come from somewhere else. We want to see a change to that. We've got the North Sea oil, which we could refine at Grangemouth. For our energy security purposes, surely we should be looking at refining our, our, our petrol here. With Britain moving towards net zero and the North Sea in decline, regardless of whether new licences are issued, more oil and gas workers will soon face the same uncertainty. Ensuring green jobs will be there to replace them is often referred to as a just transition. There's a whole lot of talk about a yeah. just transition. Yeah. Do, you, do you see that? Do you see any evidence of it? No, yeah. Um, I met ministers, uh, MSPs from uh, in the Scottish Parliament yesterday, asked a number of questions. But there's no real concrete plan. I mean, we'll say again, as I've said to other people, show me where the green jobs are, show me what the plan is, and we'll be happy to sit down, talk you through it. But right now, we need to put forward a credible plan. And for us, a credible plan is to extend the life of Greensmouth, invest in it, protect jobs and transition over to greener energy. Opposite Grangemouth across the Firth of Forth is an all too real lesson from history. Fife was once the heart of Scottish coal mining, powering the nation for the best part of a century. You could walk to work to the colliery from here? Yes, yes, you could walk to Valleyfield Colliery. And do you have any idea how many people were working in the colliery? What was this? I'd possibly say about maybe, what, 800 men. Uh, That's a lot of jobs for yes. a small village. Yes. When the pits closed, there were no new jobs, leaving communities shattered. The impact was horrendous. I was in Salzgars, and then Salzgar closed, I went down to Long Gannet, and when Long Gannet closed, I went to the, the, the power station. Sadly, it's gone now. So, me personally, I didn't know what I was going to do. 40 years on, are you still seeing the effects of that? Yes, yes. You feel a, a sense of deprivation in this village. There's drug addictions, see that. Uh, there's, as I say, there's food banks. There's people no good, good clothes and all these kind of things, eh? Are there lessons, do you think, for politicians now 
about this next transition yes. that we can learn from the mining industry? Definitely, definitely. The government's got to learn, and they've got to learn quick because it's going to happen very soon. But is the green industrial revolution providing the new jobs that workers leaving polluting industries need? Years ago, you'd see the service crew coming off just now, so they'll go on for two weeks, they'll live on the boat, eat on the boat, cook on the boat. Here in Montrose, offshore workers are not servicing oil rigs, but Scotland's largest wind farm, Sea Green. Is it necessarily a simple thing for people to just move straight off an oil rig or a platform straight into the renewable sector? I think the key thing, particularly with offshore wind and renewables, is that the opportunities are vast and there is a real need and urgency for them now. So there are two clear things that we need here in the industry. Looking ahead to a future pipeline, yes, we want to bring in new talent, we want to attract people, but we need people now, experienced people in the oil and gas industry in particular, has so much that it can give to the renewables industry. We have over 1,700 members of staff that have successfully made that transition from high carbon roles to joining us now in SSE Renewables. So up on the left, that's the vessel tracking system we use. Grant is one of them. He spent 11 years on offshore oil rigs. Now he's controlling the wind farm. What does it feel like to be in that, that new industry that's growing? Yeah, it's really exciting, to be honest. Yeah. yeah, learning all the new kind of skills and seeing all the new investment and opportunities that come for people that move over is like an exciting thing to be involved in. Back in Grangemouth, new jobs look like they're needed here and now. The renewable energy developers, they say they're going to need all the jobs they can get in the coming 10, 20 years. I don't think it's that simple. Uh, we are uh, workers, we'd like to see a simple transition. We don't think that's there. We don't recognise that there's green jobs out in the market just now. And we've been promised a green jobs revolution before and it's never happened. There's no question that green jobs are coming, but as the closure of places like this show, the fate of communities where those future workers live can't be left to chance or market forces. It's up to the government here and down in Westminster to ensure that they have a coherent plan to manage the energy transition, otherwise people will be left out in the cold. Well, for more on this, I'm joined by Anna Sauer, Scottish Labour leader, who's on a visit to Alstom's rail maintenance depot here in Glasgow. Mr Sauer, there's a good chance that Labour will be in government in Westminster in the not too distant future. Yet your party has called for no new oil and gas licences in the North Sea. Surely that's only going to mean more job losses like we're going to see at Grangemouth. Well, first of all, we're not complacent. We've still got work to do. But I think what you've seen at Grangemouth is an indication of why we have to run faster towards the transition and make sure we have both the UK and the Scottish government working in partnership to make the strategic investments we need to protect jobs, to create new jobs, to bring down people's bills and to have greater energy security so we're not reliant on more foreign imports from despotic regimes like Russia. If anything, I think Greensworth has emphasised what the failure of government results in and, and that is job losses. Instead, we have to run towards that transition, working, of course, in partnership with the oil and gas industry, who themselves can see what the long-term future is around our energy infrastructure. Yet, Labour is coming out def trying to defend jobs at Grangevale, trying to say that you know, we need to extend you know, that, the life of that facility and those jobs. On the other hand, committed to no new oil and gas in the North Sea. How does that square with managing a transition? How are you going to pull it off? Well, look, we're committed to all the existing licences and any new licences that may be issued between now and the next general election. And that in itself gives a life of over 50 years for the oil and gas industry. And I believe that the oil and gas industry will play a significant role in our energy generation for decades to come. But that's not a reason to slow down the transition. Remember, we were promised to be the Saudi Arabia of renewables and those jobs just haven't been realised here in Scotland. Instead, we have to have a green prosperity plan that has created tens of thousands of jobs at its heart. And that is going to be backed up by GB Energy, a publicly owned energy generation company that will be headquartered here in Scotland. So we can not just realise the opportunities of renewables, but be the global leader. Because there is going to be a global leader in this. I want that global leader to be Scotland. I want that global leader to be the UK. It's all very easy to talk about transition, but there's some, there are some complicating factors here social factors. I'm of course, it is. it's of all people, complicated. But A lot of people are later in their careers. A lot of the real skills you need, they're looking at retirement in maybe 10 years' time. They might not be attractive to a new employer coming into Scotland. 
investing in clean energy. How do you propose to tackle that? Well, well, I think with those workers, I think you raise a really important point. If we are saying to communities across the country that we're going to realise this transition, but it means sacrificing your jobs, it means paying higher bills till the end of time, it means more reliance on foreign imports, we are not going to take the public with us, we're not going to take the workers with us, we're going to decimate communities at the same time, and we're not actually going to manage that transition. That is not what we are suggesting. Instead, we want to work directly with those companies that are working in the energy industry and with workers to demonstrate to them, not that they have this bland promise of a job will eventually come, but they can actually see what that transition looks like and reskilling is of course important for the energy infrastructure and the transition, but it's also really important for our wider economy as well. And I think that's a dialogue, a relationship that we really want to have to make sure people feel part of that journey rather than a victim of that journey. Don't you agree though, the unions are probably gonna fight you every step of the way over some of this stuff? and that makes you politically vulnerable. But again, it depends. If the relationship with the workforce and the representative trade unions is to say, this is what's happening, no ifs, no buts, we're shutting things down and we're closing our eyes to your current job, then I can understand why that might be a concern. That is not what is being proposed. We are proposing a genuine partnership with the workforce, with the trade unions, with the oil and gas industry to make sure we have a managed transition that creates the new jobs of the future, that brings down people's bills and creates greater energy security. What we are not going to do is make the Margaret Thatcher mistake of shutting down our, our uh, coal mining industry and decimating communities. That is the wrong approach and that is not the approach we'll be taking. Anasawa, thank you very much for joining us. Well, we're going to take a break now, but when we come back, we're going to break down the numbers on the government's plans for new oil and gas. And we're also going to talk to the former Conservative Minister who resigned over the issue. And would you eat meat fed on flies? This company thinks it's the future of lower carbon meat. Welcome back to the show. Now, the government's plans to offer up annual oil and gas licenses in the North Sea has passed its first major hurdle in the Commons, but not without a struggle. Even the Climate Change Committee's own data shows that when we reach net zero in 2050, we'll still be using oil and gas for a significant portion of our energy. Our bill will improve our energy security and the energy security of yeah. Europe. The case for this bill has disintegrated upon contact with reality. I do not believe, and it pains me to say this, that this bill will advance that commitment to transition away from fossil fuels. So who's right? Does this ensure energy security and protect jobs, or is it just performative politics? Despite a boom in renewables for electricity generation, we still get 78% of our energy needs from fossil fuel, mostly gas. Nearly 40% of the gas we use comes from our own reserves in the North Sea, strengthening the argument for using our own supplies. But North Sea gas has been running out for years. So what difference will these new licenses make? Well, based on this analysis, not very much at all. One man who opposed the government's plan from the start was former Conservative MP Chris Skidmore. Chris, how much of a red line for you was the petroleum licensing bill? To commission new licenses, new explorations, new fields like Rosebank that you know, won't be open well into the late 2030s and then operating beyond 2050, breaks our net zero commitment. It breaks the 1.5 degrees pathway set out by the UNCCC and the International Energy Authority. And it came a point where I could no longer condone what my government you know, was doing. We've just been up in Scotland, the Grangemouth oil refinery, Scotland's last remaining oil refinery, is threatened with closure, 500 jobs at risk. And the argument there is we need to keep the oil and gas flowing to protect those communities which will supply the jobs of the future. Doesn't the government have a point? Well, again, it comes back to this point of you know, our existing oil and gas uh, that we are using. The pipelines are flowing. And I went up to Grangemouth uh, to talk to them as part of the Net Zero uh, review. But it is a just transition, and that means taking you know, every job with us, including those that work in fossil fuels. They're highly skilled jobs, you know, which we need to transition over to the industries of the future. But the point here is there's no clarity in saying to these people that you can keep on using fossil fuels uh, for tomorrow, tomorrow and tomorrow, beyond 2050, uh, beyond the pathway that's been set out. And that's what this licensing does. It gives false hope. If that's the case, what is the government doing with its 
oil and gas bill. What is the message it's trying to send? What I think the government is trying to do is to draw out a political uh, message that somehow those working in climate are anti sort of thinking about UK jobs. I think it's absolutely the opposite of the case that actually those people who are working in climate are thinking about the industries and the economies of the future. And it's deeply regrettable, which is why I took the decision both to resign the whip as a Conservative MP, so I'm now independent, but also to stand down. You know, my concern is for the UK to send out a message, you know, the first G7 country to sign net zero into law, that it's OK to continue to extract new additional uh, oil, which is pretty much you know, what it is. That then tells every other country they've got carte blanche uh, to do the same. So it's a big risk, but both also, for the UK and internationally. There is also the brutal economic piece, which is that we're in a net zero race. You know, investors are looking to disinvest from fossil fuels quite rapidly. Uh, across the world, you know, countries now are recognising and you know, moving towards renewable and clean power at an exponential rate. And if the uh, UK decides to stand still, it just falls simply further behind. And that was the message of my Net Zero Review, Mission Zero, that you know, we are now in a critical moment which won't come again. And there is a severe economic cost in terms of jobs, investment, in terms of regeneration that we will pay unless we move faster. So what is Rishi Sunak playing at when he says things like, I don't want to burden hardworking families with the costs of net zero? Well, I mean, the, the, the challenge here, again, it's, it's a false narrative, it's, it's misinformation. Talking around a cost when net zero ultimately is a benefit, it will come from not doing this. It needs to be done anyway. The rest of the world is doing it. And if we don't do it, we're going to pay the penalty. I think there are people frustrated by the cost of living, by just stop oil, stopping them getting to work. And that's something politicians are going to respond to. We're certainly seeing stories like that in some sections of the press. Is, is there an imminent culture war looming over net zero? It is, and I'm, I'm hoping to spend you know, this election year going around the country from a cross-party independent perspective, making the case that climate action is everyone's business. You know, regardless of who gets into government, we will need to take everyone with us. We do need to do better about setting out the economic case rather than just the environmental case. You know, my net zero review was all about the economics, demonstrating this is an opportunity. And they've done that in the States. You know, taking action on climate is called the Inflation Reduction Act. You know, it's, it's, it's about jobs, it's about growth. Chris Goodmore, thanks very much for joining us on The Climate Show. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the climate impact of eating meat has been a hot topic in recent years. And part of the reason for that is the emissions from the food that farm animals eat. And one company thinks it has an unorthodox solution to that. In the centre of London, metres away from commuters and tourists, millions of black soldier flies are being farmed. How many flies is in that crate? So probably just from looking at it, there's maybe two or three thousand in there at the moment. They're fed on food waste to fatten them up. They're five days old, they've grown quite considerably in that time. After about another five days, They've grown quite massively. They're definitely a lot more wiggly now yeah, as well. They really are. After another week or so, they've grown quite considerably and they've reached their kind of final size. These guys are quite gross and they're surprisingly stinky, but the people here think they could solve a massive environmental problem. Because when they're this fat and juicy, you can feed them to chickens and pigs and fish in place of soy and soy has a massive environmental impact. Many farm animals in the UK are fed soy, which can cause deforestation in countries like Brazil. Because insects can be farmed locally, don't take up much space and eat food waste, they're seen by companies like this as a good way of reducing the environmental impact of eating meat. Replacing fish meal and soya protein with insect-based feed can have a massive environmental effect. Because remember, you are able to use food waste to feed them, not cut down more rainforest. We can do it locally, so we're guaranteeing supply chains to farmers. But then ultimately, it's a natural product for these animals. And most importantly, we need to produce more protein. We import about 80 to 90% of it. What happens is that gets suddenly taken away from us. We need that food security, and that's what insect protein can do. Kieran's company is now developing the technology to farm insects on a massive scale. They've made machines to count tens of thousands of fly eggs in seconds, built robot arms to automate the process, and will have huge stacks of larvae growing at any one time. But how we make our food is strictly regulated, 
and some people say that regulation is slowing down progress in the insect industry. What we need to do, which we've started to do, is to allow certain safe and properly researched and scientifically supported exceptions. And that's what's beginning to happen. So in the EU, we have already had that law passed. We now are permitted at an EU level to feed insects to chickens and pigs. And we need to do that in the UK so that we don't continue to fall behind. They might not look appealing to us, but these creepy crawlies could be fattening up your pork chops in the very near future. That's certainly what this industry is banking on. Mickey Carroll, Sky News. Now, Drax Power Station in Yorkshire has been controversially receiving billions of pounds of public money for burning wood pellets to generate electricity. Now, it's classed as renewables, but the UK National Audit Office has now cast doubt on its sustainability credentials. Joining me now to discuss all that is our climate reporter, Victoria Seabrook. So, Victoria, what the NAO say? Well, as you say, biomass has always has long been controversial. Uh, we started subsidising it as a way to get off coal power in the UK in the idea that it was much greener because you plant new trees, they absorb those emissions that are released from the burning and it's, and it's cyclical. But the science of that is uh, highly disputed. This week, government auditors have raised more questions about how green it is, saying the government actually can't guarantee the sustainability because they're not measuring it uh, strictly enough, basically. The government says, well, we've already committed to tightening our rules, but this is just uh, another obstacle for the biomass industry to overcome. But it's not going to be desirable for the government to start looking again at how green it is so it's because it's green that it uh, it qualifies the industry for these multi-million pound subsidies every year because it provides uh, around a tenth of our electricity so it's a huge power plant yes that, so effectively if the government if we can't make this work that is a that's a big black hole in our sort of renewable energy generation that we've got to solve Yes, exactly, and that's made that much harder by the fact that Hinkley Point, the huge nuclear plant that was supposed to start running, well, originally, uh, once upon a time, maybe 2017, then 2025, realistically, was delayed to 2027. This week we learned it's been delayed by another two to four years, so it may not come online until 2031. It's supposed to be providing 7% of our electricity, so there's a big question about where that's going to come from in the meantime. Meanwhile, our electricity demand is growing, not least because we're trying to green the economy, moving to heat pumps and electric vehicles and so on that need more electricity. So it's uh, a big challenge for the government. Thanks, Victoria. Well, that's it for this week. Now, remember, you can catch up with all of our climate and environment news on the Sky News website or app by scanning the QR code on the screen now. Well, that's it from me. Some other guy called Tom will be back with the climate show next week.